Hello and welcome everybody to another fun filled lecture. Today we're going to go over chapter 19, the cardiovascular system, specifically blood vessels. Grab a snack. I've got my nice herbal tea here. If you don't have something to eat or drink, uh, pause now and grab it. Uh, this is going to be um, a long story. We're going to sit back and then I'm going to tell you guys a long story about <laughs> your vasculature, basically. Before I get started, I wanted to point out in our week 10 to-do list, uh, which is in the week 10 module, of course, um, the stuff that you need to be doing this week. And if you're following your study schedule, like we um, have talked about in the announcement, or if you emailed me, um, this is what you're gonna want to do uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So read the chapter uh, and watch these lecture videos, okay? Once you're done with that, um, obviously on Thursday, we're going to be meeting for lab. Uh, we're going to be uh, saying hello again to our rabbits. We'll be reunited with our rabbits. And then we are going to actually dissect the major arteries and veins in our rabbit specimens. More on that through this link. Uh, please prepare yourself before coming to lab. I know that a lot of you guys um, either overprepared for our heart dissection or underprepared um, I suspect it might have been underprepared, and I think maybe you thought you knew what you were looking at, but I'm going to um, I'm going to be surprised if that turns out to be the case. Um, I don't want you guys to get confused, so uh, I'm going to upload some photos and stuff to help you to study for the heart. Um, but last week, we should, you should have done the same thing for cardiovascular system heart, chapter 18, right? Um, if you haven't done all the heart stuff yet, then you are behind and it's time to catch up. Okay, so you're gonna have to sacrifice some other part of your life if you wanna catch up for this section because our next exam is covering all heart stuff and respiratory system. So now's the time to catch up if you can, okay? Cardiovascular system heart, cardiovascular system blood vessels we're going over today. We're gonna to be dissecting the blood vessels on Thursday. You have your homework on Friday, same usual stuff, chapter 19, uh, homework stuff from my lab and mastering, and then your physio X um, simulation, lab simulation on cardiovascular dynamics. Make sure you get those guys done over the weekend. Um, I think I might have them technically due on Sunday, uh, but I have them uh, here due on Friday just to uh, you know keep the sense of urgency. Additional resources for this week. There's always additional resources. You should always be checking them out at the end of the week, whatever week it is. Your study, your dynamic study modules, helping you to quiz yourself to find out what you do and do not know after reading the text and watching the lectures and attending lab, okay? So quiz yourself, oh, and doing your homework, right? You might wanna do your dynamic study modules before you do your homework if you have time. Um, then that way you can maximize your points on your homework. We also have a lot of um, PAL stuff. This is from the study area of my lab and mastering, practice anatomy lab. There's a uh, um, slideshow about um, cat blood vessels. It's basically a, a, a slideshow gallery and you can quiz yourself on that as well as a built-in quiz function. Um, same thing with these anatomical models for veins and arteries and pictures of a human cadaver's blood vessels. All kind of the same um thing a slideshow with an option to make yourself a little quiz or practical based on the information art labeling activities if you're into that if you like a picture that you label over and over again these are them they are also from the study area of my lab and mastering i literally just pulled links over that's all i did you can find this in the study area of my lab and mastering along with a lot of other stuff always Here's a uh, 3D anatomy. It really doesn't have, it doesn't hold a candle to um, the complete anatomy application that I'm going to be using today. Um, so I will go ahead and link that um, as well. Um, write myself a note to go into the to-do list and put in a link for the um, complete anatomy. Some fun crash course videos on blood vessels something maybe to start with. You can even start with this before you read since it's very introductory and fun, okay? These are all ways for you to study. Of course, there's always other things. You can use flashcards. You can make a one pager. You can make a study board. Uh, you can try teaching a family member this stuff, okay? There's a lot of different ways. And if you still have questions about other ways, anything that you um, think of maybe, um, 
please visit our discussion on study tips, which I started out with um, a couple of things, including this page from your student handbook on different study styles. So it's like a little quiz to figure out which study style might be best for you and what kinds of study practices to uh, take on. Here's the tutoring schedule for this semester for um, sciences, including um, anatomy and physiology, both A and B. Shelley is our go-to apparently. Here's that page from your student handbook. And then some other stuff, uh, random stuff that I have found. So if you have random stuff that you have found to be useful to you, or if you have questions about what to do, like if you're a visual learner and that you like to do this type of thing, or um, you're a tactile learner, what are the things to concentrate on, ways to study to maximize your time, to maximize that study schedule? Send them here so that we can all use it, okay? All right, let's get started. Since again, I said this was a, this is a long story. So let's get going. I'm gonna try and go a little faster because as I'm sure you've noticed, my lectures are getting a little bit long and wordy because I like to over explain things. So another day, another lecture, another opportunity for me to try to be concise. Make sure my laptop's got plenty of juice. Make sure my little Apple pen is up and running. And here we go. All right, so first let's talk about how blood vessels um, are built, okay? The blood vessel anatomy. So the cardiovascular system, again, that's your heart and your blood vessels. Your blood vessels are part of your circulatory system, which technically also includes your lymphatic system. So today we're talking about the cardiovascular system, specifically um, just the vessels part, because we already talked about the heart, right? All right, so your cardiovascular system is a closed system, right? You have two circuits going on. You have the systemic or body circuit, and you have the lung or the pulmonary circuit, okay? So as we saw last week, when we dissected our hearts and I had our lecture on the heart, you um, have blood flow, deoxygenated blood coming from the body into the right atrium, to the right ventricle, up through the pulmonary valve, up the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary arteries, to the lungs where that blood gets reoxygenated. And we're gonna be talking about that next week. That nice, fresh oxygenated blood returns to the heart. That pulmonary circuit has been completed, returns to the heart via the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, down to the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve, then up through the aortic valve, through the ascending aorta, the aortic arch, the descending aorta, <laughs> all of that to basically send that oxygenated blood throughout the entire body, okay? So quick review. The vessels involved in both the pulmonary and the systemic circuits um, come in three main flavors, okay? You have your arteries, you have your capillaries, and you have your veins. Arteries are going to be the blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart, okay? So your pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood away from the heart to the lungs. And um, the rest of your arteries are going to be branching from the aorta, okay? So the aorta is basically like the master king of arteries, okay? And all of your smaller arteries, your systemic arteries, will be branching off of that, but they are going away from the heart, carrying oxygenated blood to the body. Veins are going to be blood vessels that carry blood to the heart, okay? So you have your superior, superior and inferior vena cava, which are going to be the massive god <laughs> king veins, okay? They're carrying deoxygenated blood to the heart from the body. So everything that um, converges to form the superior and inferior vena cava um, are going to be veins. Similarly, the, um, the pulmonary veins coming from the heart, coming from the lungs to the heart are also carrying blood to the heart. It's just oxygenated blood, okay? So do not get caught up in thinking that arteries are red and veins are blue. That is incorrect. Red is oxygenated blood and blue is deoxygenated blood. You have arteries that uh, carry deoxygenated blood, 
like your pulmonary artery, and you have veins that carry oxygenated blood, such as your pulmonary veins. Okay, so the pulmonary circuit throws that on its head. You need to be aware of that. Okay, so just think arteries are leaving the heart, veins are returning to the heart, and red is oxygenated blood, and blue is deoxygenated blood. Okay, the more that you look at this system, the more videos that you watch, um, the more times you write it down, the more times you draw it out, which is the best thing to do. Even if you're not an artist, draw this out. Try to do it from memory. The more times you do it, if you can do this from memory, if you can draw this out and label all of the structures, you're golden. So get out a notebook, a stack of paper, and just start trying to scribble it down in any way you can. That is like probably my number one way of studying anything, especially anatomy and physiology. Capillaries are the tiny, the tiny, tiniest vessels that basically lie in between the arteries and the veins, okay? So remember, your blood is only traveling in one direction, right? Arteries and veins are one-way streets. Your oxygenated blood traveling from the heart to the body is going to go from the aorta to your arteries, and the arteries are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually they get so small that we call them capillaries. And those same capillaries, the blood is traveling in the same direction through that capillary bed, becomes deoxygenated as it travels past cells that are basically doing an exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide with that fresh blood. Then the blood gets depleted of oxygen, becomes deoxygenated blood, is traveling in the same direction, except now those capillaries will start to converge into small veins, larger and larger and larger veins until they become either the inferior um, or the superior vena cava. Okay, we're gonna be going over this multiple times. So let's talk about how these uh, vessels are structured um, and how they are different. Um, from one another. Hopefully my face is not, I guess I wouldn't be covering that um, in the recording. So the walls of these vessels look different. They each have three layers, okay? So I know that you're totally over <laughs> layers and the endo peri epi stuff. Um, well then, luckily for you, these things are named completely differently, but there's only three of them and the names are actually kind of intuitive, which is really nice, okay? The innermost layer is called the tunica intima, okay? Intima, like intimate. It's the innermost, closest layer to your blood, okay? The tunica intima. So tunica, like a tunic that you would wear. Um, intima, as in the innermost. So here's the tunica intima, the, um, which it has an epithelial portion, okay? So you, you see the simple squamous um, cell type of this epithelium. Here is the tunica intima of a vein, okay? Artery, vein, um, labeled here. This one happens to be a systemic artery carrying oxygenated blood, and this one happens to be a systemic vein carrying deoxygenated blood, okay? So obviously these are not pulmonary arteries and veins. Okay. In, um, or sorry, so outside of the tunica intima, wrapping over the, the tunica intima is the tunica media. Okay, media like medium, middle, okay. Okay, that tunica media is going to include a muscle layer, okay. This is smooth muscle. It's obviously, it's involuntary unless you are magical and you can control how your blood vessels constrict or dilate, um, which probably you are not. These are involuntary smooth muscles um, that cover um, over the top of the tunica intima. Please notice that the artery tunica media is much, much thicker. This muscle layer is much, much thicker than that of the vein, okay? Your arteries do a little bit of pumping of their own, um, some more than others, but this muscular layer uh, is very important, as well as the elastic 
tissue layers on either side of it. Okay, so this yellow Swiss cheese stuff that's also part of the tunica media. Okay, your, um, I guess technically that's supposed to be tunica intima. I'm not too worried about it. The tunica intima is going to include the epithelial, it's the innermost. The tunica media will include the smooth muscle, it's in the middle. And on the outer, you have the adventitia or the externa. So the tunica adventitia or tuna, uh, tunica externa, which you may see it as, but adventitia is what, um, how I learned it. Um, that is going to, of course, be external or outer. Right? And that is going to include um, basically what you see on the outside of the blood vessel. It's uh, connected tissue, um, including a lot of collagen fibers, which is very stretchy. So um, this is very important. Okay, so your blood vessels need to be, they need to be bendy, they need to be stretchy, uh, and they need to be strong. The uh, tunica media is where you're going to have that strength, and that strength is what is going to allow vaso, both vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Okay, so vasoconstriction is constricting a blood vessel, and vasodilation is opening a blood vessel. And they are able to do this, constrict and open. They need to be able to constrict and they need to be able to bounce back both ways, okay? They need to also be able to stretch and bounce back. Very important. So check out this uh, little slide image here of a, an artery versus a vein. And you'll notice that this deeply purple stained muscle tissue here is a very, very thick layer in this artery while it is a very thin layer on this vein, which is also partially collapsed because they are kind of more floppy than arteries are, okay? So when you look at the slides in lab this week, there will be one of an artery and a vein um, and a nerve. You may actually also see a cross-section of a nerve in there. Um, and you will be able to tell which one is the artery and which one is the vein by the thickness of the wall um, and really just the fact that one is being held open and the other one um, is collapsing. And that's just because the veins are a little bit less, um, the walls aren't as thick, they're a little bit more floppy, okay? So we're gonna talk a lot more about vasoconstriction and vasodilation here in a minute. Here's this image again, blown up. Again, nice thick tunica media on the artery, very thin tunica media in the vein. Um, but much thicker tunica um, adventitia, okay, no, uh, notably. You'll actually also notice that here. So the, that tunica externa or tunica adventitia is a little bit thinner on the artery than it is on the vein, but the tunica media is much thinner on the vein than it is in the artery. Okay, so arteries have circular walls, very thick walls, more smooth muscle, um, and built for very high pressure, right? Because these guys are going from the heart um, to the entire body. So just like the left ventricle has to be very, very muscular to force blood all the way through these vessels, you're creating a lot of pressure. So the arteries need to be very, very strong um, and take all of that pressure. So they're built for that high pressure. Veins um, may look a little bit oval compared to the artery um, or collapsed like this. Their walls are thinner. There is less smooth muscle. The inner lining is smooth instead of bumpy, like you see on the artery. Um, this is basically just to allow that stretching for that high pressure. So it's basically, um, for stretching. Okay, so you're basically seeing kind of folds in it while it's sort of collapsed and not stretched out. Um, so veins are built for low pressure, okay? compared to arteries. Okay, arteries, let's talk about them specifically. I'm going to switch to a red pen um, because systemic arteries carry oxygenated blood, okay? All right, so this graphic representation grossly oversimplified of the uh, circular or the, uh, actually, yeah, the circulatory system in its entirety, <laughs> kind of includes the heart as this box here, your arteries leaving the box and going to the, uh, to the body, okay? So this is literally just the, um, this is literally a systemic representation. 
we see no pulmonary stuff happening here. We've, we're not including the lungs. This is just the systemic circuit, okay? So from the heart, you have your arteries, big, thick um, artery of the aorta um, starting out and getting a little bit thinner and thinner as we go until we get into capillaries. But the arteries themselves, when we go from the aorta to the capillaries, um, there's three different types with three different names. You have your elastic arteries, which come first, okay? Your muscular arteries come after that. And then arterioles are a little bit smaller and lead to the capillaries, okay? So going from the heart to the capillary beds, the vessels are getting smaller and smaller and branching. When we talk about veins, we will see that from the capillary beds to the heart, the blood vessels are getting larger and larger and converging, right? Because the blood is traveling only in this direction, one way street, okay? All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the elastic arteries. The elastic arteries, again, these are the ones that, um, I, think it, I think it technically includes the aorta, um, but, um, and uh, so mostly the descending aorta and then the branch, the branches off of that, some of the branches off of that. So uh, as per their name, elastic arteries um, are very elastic and stretchy, okay? They have a very thick layer of this um, elastic um, connective tissue, literally elastic connective tissue, which we learned about in part A. Um, it's got that weird um, like squiggly, it looks like lasagna um, appearance to it. Um, that's what gives it its stretch and it has to bounce back, okay? So the elastic layer on elastic arteries um, is obviously extremely important. They're very, very resilient and they need to be able to bounce back, like I keep saying, okay? Lots of elastic fibers. Um, extremely resilient, okay? The muscular arteries don't have a, um, as much of an elastic fiber layer or elastic connective tissue layer, um, but they have a very, very thick muscular layer. They're very, very thick tunica media, okay? Which again is smooth muscle, right? So notice this tunica media on this elastic artery is not as thick as on the muscular artery. Makes sense, right? Muscular arteries, very muscular. Okay. Going from these um, elastic arteries and these muscular arteries, we go down until we get to relatively much smaller arteries, which are called arterioles, okay? That is basically little arteries. So arterioles are relatively uh, small. The um, smooth muscle, layer around them is literally just one cell thick. That's what this is trying to show you, just kind of like creepy and gross. Um, one cell thick, kind of spiraling around that arterial. Um, so it is able to do like, not so much pumping, but it's able to dilate and vasoconstrict the same way that the rest of the arteries are. Um, a meta arterial, just a smaller arterial leading into this capillary bed, okay? Um, so that oxygenated blood will go from the aorta to elastic arteries, to muscular arteries, to arterioles, to the capillary bed, okay? Okay, so elastic arteries are very large. They, they don't contract, but they are able to uh, um, stretch and um, recoil, stretch and recoil, very, very important, okay? So they expand and then they return to shape. They expand during systole. So remember when we talked about that last week, systolic pressure is the pressure produced by the ventricles contracting. So it's that, that um, the dub of the lub dub, it's the really loud sound. Um, and then the um, elastic arteries are going to recoil or return back to their normal shape uh, during diastole which is the um, part of your heart rhythm when your ventricles are relaxing, okay? The love, okay? High amount of elastic fibers because we need to be able to stretch and recoil again. So we're going to be protecting the arteries against high pressure 
and also helping that eat that recoil also helps to continue to move the blood along during um, diastole. Okay, so very important. Lots and lots of elastic tissues. Okay. Compared, so so just keep your eye on this real quick. So watch this. Watch how the smooth muscle increases when we get to muscular arteries. Okay, look at that. So much less elastic tissue, much more smooth muscle in muscular arteries, okay? Oh, I should mention that elastic arteries are also known as conducting arteries because they conduct the blood. They, they continue to shove the blood forward um, by stretching and constricting. Sorry, not constricting, but recoiling. Okay, so stretching and recoiling. Muscular arteries are known as distribution arteries because once you get to this point, there is this first start of branching to all of the different structures in the body that the blood is going to, okay? So the muscular arteries are a little bit smaller than your elastic arteries. Your elastic arteries are considered large vessels. The muscular arteries are considered to be medium-sized vessels. Um, they include for example, um, sorry, elastic arteries includes the aorta and the carotid, femoral, and brachial arteries, which we will see um, in the next lecture after this, um, of this week. We'll see what those, um, where those vessels are in the body, okay? Actually, I can show you right now. So check this out. So this is complete anatomy. Um, again, this is a $35 subscription for a year. So kind of a good investment um, as an anatomy student. This is, I have basically a model here with all of the, sorry. <laughs> it's asking a lot, it's asking a lot. I'm gonna try and move slow here. I'm going to remove the skeleton so that you can see the arteries and veins of the human body. I'm going to remove a couple layers here from each. So here I'm removing some of the, um, I believe that some of the, sorry, my um, Zoom thing is, oh yeah, okay, blocking. And then I'll remove a couple layers of the veins as well. So we can kind of like, kind of trim it down. Let's trim it down a little bit more here with the arteries, okay. so. As I was saying, the elastic arteries, if I zoom in very slowly, try not to panic it. <laughs> Shoot. Oh, this is great when you're running it by itself, but not when you're also running Zoom and PowerPoint and the browser at the same time. Okay, but check it out. So here's the aorta coming up out of the top of the heart, right? From the left ventricle up through the aortic arch here. The aorta then descends down through the center of your body, all right? So this is the elastic vessel or vessels, I should say. And then the muscular vessels will be this, which is that, um, that uh, subclavian. We've got the carotids up here, which we just learned are considered to be muscular arteries, okay? And then these littler guys are gonna be considered to be arterioles towards the ends of these, okay? Where we're very, very, very small. Um, muscular arteries can be down to the size of a pencil lead. Arterioles um, are obviously much smaller than that. And capillaries are literally just wide enough for a single blood cell to pass through single file. So your blood actually goes through capillaries one cell at a time. Okay, so these are these are relatively huge. The elastic vessels are relatively huge. Okay, we'll come back to this. Arterioles are considered to be small. They have, um, uh, you know, a little bit of everything. Uh, not so much or less to be uh, really that um, excited about here. Um, muscular arteries have lots of muscle. Um, elastic arteries have lots of elastic fibers. Arterioles have a little bit of everything. 
They are auto under um, autonomic nervous system control. They control the blood flow between the arteries and the capillaries, which is extremely important. The capillary beds is where um, gas and nutrient exchange happens between your cardiovascular system and your cells of your entire body. Um, so that um, flow of nutrients and oxygen is very, very strictly controlled. Some organs will be receiving more oxygen and nutrients than others at any given time. And this depends on whether or not your sympathetic or your parasympathetic nervous system is the most active, right? So uh, think about it, your sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, right? One of its aims is to increase your heart rate. One way that you would do that is to, uh, um, to start constricting your blood vessels and uh, these arterioles where capillary beds are for organs that are, um, whose functions are less important during fight or flight. So consider the arterioles that are controlling or leading to the capillary beds in your digestive system. These guys will constrict and there will be less blood flow to your digestive system during fight or flight. Um, more blood flow will go to your skeletal muscle, right? And your heart and your lungs and your eyeballs, <laughs> because that's what's um, critical in that moment, according to your brain, your lizard brain, right? This is very, very important. All right, capillaries. I love capillaries. These are the smallest vessels. They're teeny tiny. They're literally just the, the diameter is just enough for a single blood, red blood cell to pass through single file, which is incredible, right? These are also known as exchange vessels. Um, because this is the site of gas and nutrient exchange with the cells of your body, right? So this highly oxygenated blood um, goes into this capillary bed, which is basically just this web of capillaries. The blood is all flowing in the same direction always, but these capillaries, one, they are very, very numerous, and two, they may connect um, in some ways. Here, this is basically so that you basically have a single capillary um, going past nearly every cell in your body. The diffusion of gases and nutrients or the passing of gases and nutrients between the blood that's traveling through these capillaries and the cells that are nearby is literally just the chemical physical process of that molecule traveling from like one place to another. Um, so you have to have capillaries everywhere. If you consider your arterioles to be like the main roads, um, your arteries are like the highways and the freeways. That makes your capillaries the like the little side roads and the um, like the uh, that back alleys that go in between rows of houses. These get to each house, right? These ones have to get to each and every cell, be close enough to be able to diffuse oxygen out into the cell, and for that cell to be able to diffuse its carbon dioxide and other waste products back to the capillary to be passed back to the heart, to go to the lungs, um, or in the case of waste, metabolic waste products, um, the kidneys or the liver. All right, so they don't work alone. They work as a bed. Okay, so a capillary bed is basically all the capillaries in between an arteriole and a venule, which is the um, analogous structure in the venous system, which we'll talk about here in a minute. A precapillary sphincter is a little bundle of smooth muscle that sits at the base of the capillary between the arteriole um, or the meta arteriole and the capillary bed itself. These little guys, as well as the uh, smooth muscle that's in the arteriole itself, which we already talked about, are going to be controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Um, and they are going to be each individually controlled to literally control the amount of blood flow and therefore nutrient and gas exchange that certain tissues receive. So if all of these little precapillary sphincters contract, as you can see by this image, then the blood flow will cease to the branches that they um, are in front of, right? and force blood to travel through another way, okay? So whatever's left. So this particular pathway um, is left open for blood to pass through. So consider this again to be like a capillary bed in your digestive system 
and the sympathetic nervous system is active, has been activated. You're in fight or flight. You don't need your digestive system. You need that blood in other places. You need it in your heart, your lungs, your eyeballs, your skeletal muscle, so that you can get away from the threat, right? The um, tissues of your digestive system will therefore um, not receive as much blood as it would if the parasympathetic nervous system was in control. And then of course, once that parasympathetic nervous system comes back into control and you get back into rest and digest, if this capillary bed is in your digestive system, these precapillary sphincters would relax and then you would have maximum blood flow to all of these capillaries and you know, you'd have your happy gas and nutrient exchange going on there. And then vice versa. You may have vasoconstriction in other places, okay? Of, of pre-capillary sphincters, depending on what needs to happen, right? So one more image of this, this is all the same wordage again. Your arteriole leads to your capillary bed. Your arteriole um, also has smooth muscle, which is under autonomic nervous system control. Um, but you also have these pre-capillary sphincters, which um, relax and allow blood through or contract and stop blood from passing through different parts of the capillary bed. Okay, and these are only on the arterial side, right? Having, having capillary sphincters on the, vein, on the venous side um, wouldn't make any sense because you would just be blocking the blood flow from leaving the capillary bed. Um, and the capillaries are so delicate, their walls are literally one epithelial cell thick. They're so tiny and so delicate that they would burst and you would probably die. So pre capillary sphincters only, only pre. Otherwise you would probably die. <laughs> there are three different types of capillaries based on their, uh, the structure of their walls. You have your continuous capillaries, which are ones in which the, um, those epithelial cells, which again, like I said, are just one uh, squamous epithelial cell thick they are, are all touching each other, okay? So continuous capillaries, all of these epithelial cells, these squamous, simple squamous cells are just, they're all touching each other. They're connected by tight junctions, which is very important, right? And your desmosomes, also important. We learned about them in part A and we encountered them again um, uh, at some point that I can't think of now. It must've been the nervous system. Um, and we also have fenestrated capillaries. These guys have the same wall of a single cell layer of epithelial simple squamous cells, but those cells, those individual squamous cells have pores through them that stuff can go through, okay? Where the cells touch each other, you still have tight junctions. So notice the tight junction in each of these images. The tight junction is just literally where the cells are touching. Wherever the wall, the cell, the wall cells are touching, you're going to have tight junctions holding them together. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a structure. You wouldn't have a capillary. And then uh, finally, sinusoid capillaries are the most permeable of all. Okay, so continuous capillaries, they um, are going to allow stuff to travel between the cells to a certain extent. But most of the stuff that is traveling from inside of these continuous capillaries to the surrounding cells and cell fluid, that process is going to be um, happening via transcytosis. Okay, so it's literally going to be endocytosed on one side of the squamous cell and exocytosed on the other. Fenestrated capillaries, you've got pores that allow certain things to just go straight through the cell. Um, without actually going inside of the cell body itself. And then sinusoid capillaries have these huge gaps, like literally where the cells are not even touching. You do have places of course where the cells do touch, which makes this still a cohesive structure sort of, um, but these ginormous gaps in a sinusoid um, capillary, like sinus um, as in like a big gap or cavernous, gap <laughs> um, is uh, properly named for the way that these um, look and are structured. The gaps here are so large that macrophages on the inside of the capillary can reach through and grab pathogens from inside and pull it in. 
um, which is pretty awesome. So you have these large intercellular clefts here. Okay. And again, notice all of these are capillaries and they are all so teensy tiny that a single red blood cell can pass through at one time. So your blood cells literally have to line up in single file to pass through the capillaries, which is pretty awesome. The oxygen that your blood cells are carrying um, diffuses out of the capillary and into the surrounding cells. Um, and this is literally diffusion. So the oxygen is higher here than it is out here. So it wants to go where there's less of itself. Same thing with carbon dioxide that's in these cells. Um, it is traveling uh, down its concentration gradient the same way. That is how gas exchange occurs. So here, check it out. Bulk flow or exchange. We'll call it gas slash nutrient exchange. Um, is going to happen uh, differentially depending on which type of capillary we're talking about, right? So very, very small things like gases can come out of a continuous capillary, can come out of all three really. Um, slightly larger molecules can pass between the walls or through the walls of a fenestrated capillary and much, much larger things can travel through the walls of a sinusoid capillary. But generally speaking, again, arterial, Precapillary sphincter, as long as that precapillary sphincter is relaxed, you can have blood flow through the capillary. Um, you have red blood cells, uh, you have lots of proteins also passing through. The oxygen from the red blood cells, as well as nutrients and other raw materials, will diffuse down their concentration gradients out of the capillary and to the cells around it. And uh, the carbon dioxide and other metabolic wastes that the cells produce will also tra travel down its concentration gradient into the nearby capillary. And as this process happens, the blood as it passes through is going to be dropping its oxygen off as well as its nutrients and stuff and picking up carbon dioxide. So as it passes through, it goes from being oxygenated blood to deoxygenated blood. And it goes into a venule, which goes into a vein, uh, which returns to the heart, right? So. The reasons why this happens is not just diffusion. You also have pressure, a certain amount of pressure in the capillaries. It's not nearly as much in the, as it is in the elastic or the muscular um, veins or in the arterioles, um, sorry, muscular or elastic arteries and the arterioles. Um, but there is a slight amount of pressure in the capillaries that allows from the blood that pushes stuff out. The interstitial fluid pressure of course, if you have lots and lots of um, fluid pressure on the outside of the capillary, that's gonna make it much, much more difficult for the stuff inside to diffuse out. Um, the osmotic pressure of each of those, okay? So the actual pressure of the blood in, in its entirety, the pressure of the extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid in its entirety, but consider now the osmotic pressure. So the pressure of just the water passing through the capillary and the pressure of just the water in the interstitial fluid, okay? So both of these are considered to be colloids to a certain extent. Your blood is a colloid because your red blood cells don't like dissolve in the water that's in your blood, right? So your blood is um, suspended in that water. And then the same thing for large molecules inside the interstitial fluid. Um, it's a colloid, they're suspended in there. So the water, um, has its own concentration gradient, right? We talked about osmosis in part A. Water too will travel down its own concentration gradient, so you have to consider that as well. Um, water will leave and water will return based on whether there's more of it on the outside or on the inside of the capillary. Physics, osmosis, okay. So all of these things. Okay, one more image. All of this is the same words. Filtration is what we call um, uh, blood and uh, um, molecules in the blood leaving the capillary and going into the interstitial fluid. And that happens nearer to the arterial side, right? Because this is where the oxygenated blood is. So stuff is going to be leaving the blood and, le and entering the cells. As the red blood cells travel through the, or through the capillary, 
they are going to be losing their uh, oxygen and nutrients via filtration. At some point, there will be equal passage of stuff into and out of the capillary. And then once the red blood cells um, are depleted of all of their oxygen, um, they now um, are deoxygenated and they need to return to the heart and lungs, right? Um, but you do have resorption at this point of certain things um, that may have been filtered out. So just like in this image right here, you might have stuff like water, for instance, that leaves and then comes back. You might have stuff that um, comes back here. Um, and the reabsorption of uh, waste materials um, happens here too, right? So fluid re-enters. Um, since the pressure go went down, water is going to fill that back up, okay? All right, so if you have excess fluid and water and stuff that is leaving the capillaries um, but does not all get reabsorbed on the venous side of the capillary bed, then you have your lymph vessels to pick that up, right? So we talked about the lymphatic system. We know that it picks up extra interstitial fluid and returns it to the bloodstream this is where that extra interstitial fluid comes from. Okay, so it leaks out of the capillaries. It may return into the capillaries and stay in the cardiovascular system. If it does not, then it will be picked up by your little lymphatic capillaries, um, travel through the lymphatic system until eventually getting to the ducts that dump it back into the cardiovascular system, into the blood vessels. All right. Let's talk about veins, all right? So we already talked about arteries. Let's switch my pen color here. This is again, systemic. So what we're going to be seeing here is going to be um, deoxygenated um, blood because veins in the systemic circuit carry deoxygenated blood from the body to the heart, right? From the body to the heart in the systemic circuit. All right, just like arteries, there are three types of veins. You have your large veins, your small veins, and your venules, okay? So just like you have arterioles, which are like baby arteries, you have venules, which are like baby veins. Just to reiterate, with your arteries, we talk about them as being very large and work our way smaller, right? So the elastic arteries are large vessels, the muscular arteries are smaller and they branch and get smaller and smaller until we get to arterioles and get to the capillary bed. From the capillary bed, since blood is all traveling in the same direction, we go from smaller to bigger, okay? So you have your venules first. If we're following the flow of the blood, the venules converge into small veins and the small veins converge into large veins. And then they all converge into the, um, inferior and superior vena cava, right? But again, the blood is traveling all in the same direction, one way street. Okay, so here are your uh, medium size, AKA for the sake of this class, we'll call them these small guys, small sized veins. Um, and your large veins, um, the structure is uh, very similar um, but the overall size is different, okay? So the overall structure is basically the same. Um, these include the superior and inferior vena cava, cave, plural, pardon me. Um, they may also be called the great veins. And then your small or medium-sized veins, um, the radial and ulnar veins, let's take a look at those guys. Those are here and here. So these are your small sized veins here and here. Um, and these are your arterioles hanging out alongside, right? Um, they are named the same, by the way, we're going to see this, but this is pretty cool. You've got your radial artery and your radial vein and your ulnar artery and your ulnar vein, which is nice, it's very nice. Um, correspond generally in size to uh, uh, muscular arteries, your small veins do. Okay. And your 
large veins if you want to take a look at actually nope same deal so like i said your large and medium veins have the same basic composition just the overall size is different okay so this composition is the same for both the small and the large veins so your large veins include the vena cava um, that would be of a plural in case you're wondering and then the um small veins is this with i'm going to fix that nearly no smooth muscle um for either of them really uh, and the thickest layer is the adventitia that's true of the large veins as well so same composition just different sizes venules the little baby veins these the smallest of the not blood vessels smallest of the veins capillaries are the smallest blood vessels um they are going to collect the blood from the capillaries right send them back to the small veins which send them to the large veins which go to the heart um again the um you have very little smooth muscle going on here this is true of like all vein types um the walls are mostly connective tissue okay so they're very very thin walled like very very little um elastic elastic tissues um no elastic tissues and very little smooth muscle tissue going on here okay so the venules are between the small veins and the capillary beds venous valves are really cool so by the time the blood reaches the veins by the time it reaches the other side of the capillary beds and starts to make its way back to the heart all of that pressure that the left ventricle um has exerted on those elastic arteries and the muscular arteries um, and the arterioles to get the blood to the capillaries that pressure is pretty much dissipated by the time you get to the capillary bed by the time you get to the capillary bed, there is little to no um, huge pressure change between um, systole and diastole. Um, so the lub dub kind of just is nothing. It kind of just stays the same by the time you get there, which is kind of crazy to think about. And part of the reason why you don't take a pulse out of vein, you take a pulse at an artery, because your veins don't have a pulse. They just don't. The blood sits there, it does get pushed through but not with the kind of pressure that you can detect from the outside, like you can with an artery. Also, you'll notice that um, the difference if you between cutting an artery and cutting a vein. Cutting a vein will just, blood will just kind of like pour out, but if you cut an artery, it will spurt. That is the blood pressure in the artery. That's what you're feeling when you take blood pressure, when you take a blood pressure reading, okay? You're feeling the pressure in the artery because the arteries are, where the blood comes from the heart. And that pressure from that uh, systolic pressure from the ventricle is felt. So that lack of pressure in the veins means that we need a different way to, um, or another way to pass, or what should I say, maybe like an insurance policy to make sure that that blood makes it back to the heart, right? Part of this insurance policy are these venous valves, which are one-way valves um, you might think of it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like, but not really like the lymphatic system because these valves are on the inside of the, of the veins, okay? They, um, they open when blood gets pushed through them in the correct direction, and then they shut so that blood does not fall back down, okay? So consider this to be like a large vein of your leg. And maybe this is uh, your gastrocnemius muscle, and this is the solaris, which is the one that's right next to it, right? So when you walk, you contract these muscles in your calf, right? When the muscles contract, they get shorter and they get fatter. They're going to press up against the veins around them. And they're going to squeeze the veins that are in between them, too. When the veins get squeezed, that pushes blood through. It's only going to be able to go in the right direction because of one way valves and it won't be able to go fall back down into your feet, which is uh, important right so the blood is going to slowly work its way back up the inferior vena cava for the most part. Um, to get back to the heart right so they're going to help to overcome gravity these valves help to overcome gravity due to this low pressure in the veins, which is just normal and natural okay. 
We call this process the muscular pump, okay? Prevents backflow of blood in the veins. So again, if this is your gastrocnemius uh, and your solaris here, gastrocnemius and solaris, I suppose, when you walk, you're going to constrict those muscles. Um, you're gonna contract those muscles, which are going to squeeze the veins in your lower legs. The blood can only travel in one direction because one-way valves only open and allow something to travel through them in one direction. The ones down below are going to be closed so blood can only go one way, okay? Then this valve will close and the blood will only be able to continue to go higher, okay? Um, so the lower valve remains closed. The upper valve will be forced open by the pressure that these muscles made pushing blood up through it, okay? So the muscular pump is how we pump the um, deoxygenated blood in our veins back to our heart. So this happens throughout our body, okay? So your skeletal muscle uh, is extremely important. One more reason to keep moving, right? Movement allows your lymphatic system to drain fluid from your body. Um, and similarly, skeletal muscle movement allows for your veins to transport your deoxygenated blood back to your heart, which is also critically important, right? The other way um, that veins are, um, that blood passes or is um, moved through veins is called the respiratory pump. So literally the, um, the, the action of inhaling actually expands your abdomen. So the muscles of your abdomen are going to um, move basically. And then also um, um, exhaling is going to cause the muscles of your thorax to contract. And all of this contraction and relaxation has the same effect of squeezing blood along past one-way valves so that it's constantly forced forward. Um, if these valves go out, then um, you end up with varicose veins um, if they're like on a superficial level, right? So like, um, I don't know, it's at a certain point, your valves kind of go bad and you end up with um, blue veins like in your legs mostly usually. Um, and that's because the valves went bad and the blood is, uh, is given a chance to pool. So it's literally deoxygenated blood kind of pooling um, in, those, in those veins. Blood distribution in the body at any given time. At any given time, your veins have most, the vast majority of your blood in them. It's pretty amazing. Evo, no. My dog is like trying to get in the door. He's like gonna bust down the door right now. Stop, Jesus. Okay, so your, your veins um, are also known as reservoirs or blood reservoirs, okay? So they actually, they're able to stretch and they're able to hold a lot of your blood. Um, if you need that blood, like if your sympathetic nervous system gets activated, your veins uh, with their limited um, smooth muscle can all constrict uh, and force the blood out, which means that it's going to be basically everywhere else. But uh, when you're relaxed and in normal times, your blood, a lot of your blood hangs out in your veins. Um, the rest of it is going to be in your arteries, um, might be in your lungs and in the pulmonary circuit. Uh, and then there's always gonna be a little bit in your heart, hopefully, and there will always be a little bit in your capillaries, right? But the capillaries are so, so small, although blood passes through them all the time, it's at any given moment, it's not very much, right? Because it can only pass through one blood cell at a time, right? Okay, so your systemic veins um, our, um, our reservoirs for your blood. It's where a lot of your blood is kept. So they also may be seen or spoken about as capacitants, vessels, or blood reservoirs. Okay. All right. Reiterating again, the pulmonary circuit from the right ventricle through the pulmonary valve up the, um, the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, to the lungs, then from the pulmonary, from the lungs to the pulmonary veins, down into the left atrium, okay? Right ventricle, pulmonary arteries, lungs, pulmonary veins, left atrium. That is your pulmonary circuit. Your systemic circuit is 
uh, sorry, left ventricle um, aortic valve, um, ascending aorta, aortic arch, descending aorta, um, elastic arteries, um, muscular arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, small veins, large veins, um, superior, inferior vena cava, which are technically large veins. The aorta is technically an elastic artery. Okay, left ventricle, aorta, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, to the vena cava, to the right atrium. Okay, make sure if you print something like this out, um, maybe cut out some little paper arrows and place them um, all along the path so that you know what direction the blood is flowing. Um, print this out and laminate it and draw on it with a dry erase marker. Draw the arrows. Um, get your kid involved, you know, get your cousin or your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad or your grandma or your grandpa or your friends. Put it down in front of them and ask them if they can figure it out. Then teach it to them, show them. Everybody should know how the heart works, right? Okay, let's, oh, you know what? We're not going to. We are going to break because we are about halfway through, hallelujah. So let's, um, let's call it here and then reconvene as we consider the physics of blood flow, including um, blood pressure, what blood pressure is, um, how it changes, why it changes, um, how we measure it, and then some developmental aspects and some uh, common problems. And then we will, and then we will actually have to name them. <laughs> so we're not done yet. We're gonna talk about some physics uh, and then we're going to talk about which arteries and which veins you actually need to know. Okay. Um, so until then, go grab a snack, go take a break, and I will see you back here um, to talk about the rest of chapter 19.